Hello, everyone. Welcome to Listening to the Wind, IWSA's interview series. And I'm delighted to be sitting today with Graham Harvey, CEO of Windship Technology Limited. Hello, Graham. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking your time to join us. Um, Graham qualified as a naval architect before developing a passion for designing structures in composite materials for clients, such as the RNLI and America's Cup yacht teams. Multiple roles followed, managing businesses with material supply and component manufacturing environments, where implementing technology to gain a business advantage were key to their success. Graham joined Windship Technology in April 2021. So first of all, congratulations on the new position, Graham. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Kevin. Yeah, you have no idea what you're taking. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, it, welcome to a growing, you know, really momentum building uh, industry segment as well. Yeah, no, it feels uh, it feels very active. So uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a indeed. That, that's why I've got all these grey hairs. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. Well, without further ado, um, I'd like to hand the reins over to you uh, for your presentation, and I'll see you on the other side with uh, some discussion points. And I'm I'm really looking forward to this uh, update on windship technology. So handing Great over stuff. to you. All right, thanks, Gavin. Right, let's. Um... See if we can get the share screen functioning successfully. Yep, we can see you there. Get you up to full speed. Great stuff. Okay, let's uh, move around so I can actually drive the uh, presentation here as well. Great. <clears throat> okay, so what I'd like to do uh, today is, is provide you with an update uh, of some of the activities we've been progressing with um, at Winship. Uh, particularly on the design of our zero emission windship. Um, this has been based really, it's around our holistic solution um, for the removal of greenhouse gases in commercial shipping, as most windship um, type ideas are for. And, and whilst it seems there are some discussions uh, and agreements still to be ironed out uh, as to the rate, rate of reduction of greenhouse gases following the, the latest meetings, the direction uh, to us and I'm sure to everyone is, is clear. Uh, and the requirement of zero emission will be upon us um, at some point in the future, whether that's 20, 30, 35, 40 or 50, whatever, we're, we are heading in that direction. So what I'd like to highlight today is that the solution is now within our grasp and provides an economic benefit as well when installed. So the development of, of uh, our solution has been undertaken over the last seven years or so. Um, there's been a group of professionals uh, with broad and current experience of ship design and operation working on this. The initial work was around the development of the rigs. Um, however, probably a few years ago, uh, we realised that to tackle the problem of decarbonisation, we really, really needed to take a more inclusive approach and include the drivetrain and hull optimization into our solution. The slide here is a representation of a 115,000 ton tanker fitted with four of our windship rigs. And with this design, we've taken the advantage of the large deck areas and included solar panels as part of the propulsion package. And I'll cover a bit more about the, you know, the future parts of the design tray or the drivetrain uh, in a future slide. But you can see from the sort of um, new look we're having that already we have a much lower superstructure um, because of our change in drivetrain. Um, and although we've shown a forward bridge for coming into, uh, into port activities, with this size of rig and ship, we actually have visibility underneath our rigs as, as we go along. So there's all sorts of changes and perhaps benefits to be dealt with as we change the design. As I said, the initial focus was on the development of the unique and, and now patented trifold rigs. Um, and we believe these provide the highest power density of current wind technologies. The trifold rigs allow us to obtain considerable power at each installation point, while still maintaining a modest overall height. The performance of the windship rigs has been developed um, and analyzed by CFD with, with Cape Horn Engineering and it's been independently verified by the University of Southampton Wolfson unit. The rig has been wind tunnel tested as per the pictures you see here and in fact we were back in the tunnel this week 
checking some performance improvements and enhancements. One to see whether we can change the power out, but also maybe modify the, the shape, maybe make it uh, more cost effective to build because you know, we're, we have to look at all aspects of the product. And currently the rig and the whole drivetrain system are being reviewed by DNV uh, with the aim of getting an approval in principle for the complete system in the next month or so. <clears throat> So we anticipate providing rigs in three product sizes, the 36 meters, 48 meters, and 60 meters. So we have our same rear trailing flap size, just increasing the numbers as the rig size goes up. Our current focus is very much on the 36 and 48 meter rigs. Uh, and these are capable of being raised and lowered for port operations or where low air draft is required. The trailing edge flaps can also be folded away in the down position to increase access. And these rigs uh, will be fully computer controlled uh, in service. The main aerofoils are composite construction. As you heard from Gavin, my, my background in composites is uh, advantageous in this side. And we're going to be using similar techniques and materials as developed in the wind turbine industry. And the rigs sit on top of a steel cruciform base, which is attached to a slew bearing on the main deck which allows the whole rig to orientate to the required wind direction. Now, the power these rigs generate becomes apparent when we can, uh, looking through VPP, we can see that three 36 meter rigs can provide sufficient thrust to sail a 74,000 ton bulker at 12 knots in typical trade winds of 25 knots. And we have conducted weather routing for typical routes. And while it clearly depends on the actual route and the seasons, et cetera, et cetera, on average, we would expect to provide the equivalent of between 35 and 40% of the required power with these rigs. So onto the drivetrain a bit. Um, the first item to highlight is just like other wind power solutions, you can retrofit our rigs to existing ships. However, as with all other current solutions, the fuel savings can only be made through reducing the power of the main engine. And these current large two strokes do not operate at their best with constant variation in power requirements, which would be required to match the, the surge and, and, uh, and lull that occurs with winds. Therefore, the Windship Zero solution is to, is, uh, is, uh, is to change these engines for a modular diesel electric system, which allows us much greater flexibility and the ability to turn engines off and on. And the electric drive provides high torque with variable revolutions. And the electric system allows us to add in other green technologies such as solar, which you saw on the earlier picture. So whilst we continue to use fossil fuels to provide the, main, the remaining power, we have incorporated a carbon capture system, which improves the amount of power we can generate from our heat recovery system, which provides the all important clean exhaust. One point to note is that should clean fuel technology quickly develop, the mod modular diesel electrics could be replaced with the required modern engines. And they're currently designed to sit on flat racks and be easily be removable for maintenance. So what does this solution mean in economic terms? We've recently completed a study on a Campsomax on several transoceanic routes over all four seasons. The results showed that compared with other modern vessels, we would at a speed of 11 knots on average be saving 60% of the fuel consumption in each round trip loaded and ballast. We also have zero emissions, therefore saving around 16,000 tonnes of CO2 per year, which with the current carbon trading rate at $60 a tonne is close to a million dollars. The capex of the windship system is expected to be largely offset by the simplification of the build without having to construct the ship around the main engine. So I'll leave you with this slide that, that uh, we believe the future is, is, is here or is certainly getting here. Um, and we are awaiting the final results from, from DNV on our drivetrain simulation and the rig IOP. And then we'll be looking to enter the next phase, uh, which will be the design approval and then the construction of these rigs. So there we go, Gavin. That's a sort of uh, uh, quick update of, of where we are.
Indeed, indeed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I almost want you to leave leave the picture of uh, oh, okay. of, of the zero emission <laughs> ship up there. No, she's a beautiful design. She looks she looks uh, really really sleek lines. Um, you know, and I, I particularly uh, it was very interesting. You were talking about the modular aspects of that um, uh, design with you know the as you say as as alternative fuels become um, yeah. uh, available, then you can actually be swapping out. The diesels for what well, whichever whichever, whichever of those yeah. systems uh, wins through. Yes, yeah. yes, and and again, it's you know uh, I think we're all very conscious. It's easy to say that we can just whip the engine out and change it over. Clearly, there would be a fuel tank change and all sorts of handling systems. But in principle, what we're trying to get over is is thinking through that that these assets have to be here for quite some number of years and. Mm nobody really wants to be investing in something that hasn't got a future so something that you can change if needed um, mm. and the, the wind will continue to provide that free energy source or somewhat free energy source so you'll need less of the alternate fuels if that's the case no i know and i think that's that's been a very strong message around you know wind propulsion is that you know delivering that uh, funnily enough that predictable free energy you know a lot of a lot of the industries always seen wind as unpredictable but actually over a long period of time you know 10 20 up to 30 percent of of uh, free energy being delivered to the vessel on day one and on the last day of that vessel's life uh, is actually a, a predictable um, uh, energy delivery in an unpredictable world yes yeah and i think uh, again, you know, it, it's, it comes through the research and, and from, the, again, a lot from the, the racing sailing, but just the ability, I, I think we all have a picture there, as you say, that the wind is unpredictable and we have visions of ships stuck in the doldrums. And, but today's understanding of weather and weather routing and, and winds means that with clever routing of your ships, um, you do have, with different seasons, a very good understanding. Uh, of what power you're going to get, where you're going to get it, and how long it's going to take you to get there. Yeah, in, indeed. Actually, I was talking with a um, a couple of racing racing guys uh, a few a few months back, and they they were saying, "Oh, well, what kind of weather routing data would you like? We 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 have sort of a, a point a, a data point per second." Uh, and I'm like, well, probably we don't need to go down that far. But but those margins, that that information, and the way of harnessing all of that data. And weather routing has really been developed extensively in the racing world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, no, it has. And and you know, it, it is. It's just a case of moving from our you know previous understanding of, of you know tea clippers and the cutty suck and putting sails back on ships. Are we mad? To actually, we're using wonderful aerofoils, modern technology, and with a modern understanding, satellite systems and weather routing. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a very good way of getting about. It doesn't suit if we're just hopping across the channel or very short rigs, there's always going to be issues. But where we're looking to ship a lot of goods, transoceanic on decent journeys, mm. uh, it, it really makes sense. No, indeed. And, and you, you, you mentioned um, that the, the system is uh, built with composites. Mm -hmm. Now, the scaling of those systems, I mean, are there any, are there any challenges around the use of composite material? There's, there's challenges around every uh, every material, and uh, I speak as a as a composite uh, you know lover, and I love composite Indeed. materials. But there's some things that that uh, metals and steel do infinitely better, uh, and there are things like uh, aerofoil shapes, um, which are done in composites and work tremendously well. So yes, there's always there's not so much issues. There's just ways you design with them. But uh, again, you know the the biggest thing we can tell people is is go and have a look at the wind turbine industry, mm. the the size of the rigs, and you know we look at these things and say, gosh, they're thirty six meters tall, or in this in the picture we look, they're forty eight meters tall, and yeah. how big are they and huge? And then you know you will see that today's modern uh, wind turbines are ninety meters plus. They maybe not got the same cord width, but um, they're, they're seeing some significant loads and that's gone through a process and Absolutely. you know modern composite aircraft wings uh, you know they're, they're out there and you know we fly on them and you know they're, they're good you know, so you they, they need they need design they need uh, proper design mm. um, but yeah they're, they're, they're good they work and they're tough for the for the job so yeah 
I'm very happy. And I, and I think actually, you know, touching on that point with the turbine industry, I mean, in effect, you know, the the wind propulsion industry is, you know, is is I, I can't believe I'm saying using wind on on ships is new, but it is a new sector. Yeah. But actually, we're getting those advantages that a lot of that material at scale is already being produced. And they're now looking at the recycling of that material as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's probably a challenge that we don't have to worry about too much. No, we, we are. We're, we're following on the coattails mm. and and they have, um, you know, pioneered again, the volumes of the materials they use have, have driven mass um, you know, uh, production, which has driven the cost down for a lot of us. The processing methods have been refined. So that's all driven in the right direction. They're using recycled materials for the core materials. And I, I understand they're considering what they can do in terms of thermoplastic materials for the skin. So uh, in, in time, whether it's bio resin systems, whether it's thermoplastics, you know, recycling will find its way in. I don't think it's fully there yet, but um, yeah, hopefully we can live on the, I said, on the coattails of their, uh, their, their pioneering research. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, obviously we're focused on the on the wind element of, of, of the ship, but it is interesting that you have incorporated a carbon capture uh, system into the into the design. Um, mm. Could you just unpack that a little bit a little bit more? How how in a sense how does that work and how does that fit into the whole decarbonisation uh, aspect of the vessel? Yeah, well, we, we you know we're very conscious that <clears throat> we'd love to have a, a zero emission ship. It sails all the time. And, and as I said, you know, we are finding on a number of our weather routings that a large amount of the time the ship can sail. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there is going to be times, whether it's storm conditions or uh, you're coming into port or you're close to land, you're going to have to have engines and be able to, to run the ship with engines. Mm -hmm. Today, fossil fuels, uh, whilst they have the problems of, of our greenhouse gases, are a very effective fuel. So our job is just to minimise it as much as possible. And then with those fuels, we've run it through and we're a little bit cagey at the moment as we go through our final um, uh, analysis with DNV and sorting out agreements. But we, we simply put have a carbon capture system and the reaction that that's doing um, helps our heat recovery process. So we're actually getting a lot more energy from mm. our exhaust gases than perhaps a standard ship does. So we're being very efficient with the fuel that we burn, as well as capturing all the CO2, NOx, SOx in particular matter, we are um, getting more energy back from our general gases so than most ships are. Pretty much optimizing fossil fuel energies that are pretty much, uh, engines that are pretty much already optimized, so. Kind of, yes. <laughs> yeah. And again, yeah. all, all with the, the aim of just driving down the amount that is needed. Uh, and as we said, at times, maybe they get swapped out to something that's that's more beneficial, much better, great. Uh, we, we don't have an issue with that. But what we what we saw at the beginning, and we have and, and love to retrofit our rigs to ships, but getting that fuel consumption back means controlling the engine. And it's it's a lot harder with a big two stroke engine. Yeah, no, no, fair enough, fair enough, absolutely. And what's been the reaction from the industry on, on, on this concept? Because, you know, I, I saw this come out um, you know, there was a, some initial reaction, you know, public reaction, which was very positive. Yeah. Um, yep. What's been the reaction, you know, not behind closed doors, but in, in your interactions <laughs> with uh, no, the ship I owners think, and the... I, I think, you know, when, when we can explain in a little more detail, sort of mm -hmm. under our NDA possible, but then, then um, I think most people, the, the penny drops, you know, and uh, I think they're, yeah, they, they can see the the... Uh, I, I hesitate to say it's not rocket science because it sounds like it's not very clever. It, it, it's clever, but like a lot of a lot of ideas, it's piecing things together in a sensible manner and mm. providing an overall solution. Um, and so, yeah, the, the reaction to date has been very positive. And you know, my job now and the job of the team is to turn that positive reaction into real physical hardware for everybody. Right. So sophisticated simplicity. <laughs> Lovely, well put. There we go. <laughs> I've no idea what it means. No, no, but, but indeed, I mean, you know, if you've if you've got if you've got a, a a system that is pretty much, I mean, when you're harnessing the wind, there is a really strong element of simplicity there. We've done it before. We know we've increasingly knowing how to do that even better at this kind of scale. So mm -hmm. there is a simplicity there. But it it 
behind that is a huge amount of sophisticated work that's been done. So um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, and, the best the best solutions often look simple, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we we're trying to make them look simple. Absolutely. Um, one one of the one of the uh, uh, interesting points as well is in the market. So I, I know I noted that that was a that's a bulk carrier that you're looking at there. Mm -hmm. um, what other segments are you looking at for? Um, you know, the development of these zero emissions concept vessels, but also you mentioned about the retrofitting of the rigs. Um, are there any restrictions on on any of the the, the, the shipping segments for that? No, we're, we're not being restrictive. We we know you know we we operate best with ships that are going to be operating at, at our, I'll call it relatively slow speed. So ships that are doing typically twelve knots at the moment that are steaming at that level, and that fits in with the 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 uh, bulker and tanker style market. Mm -hmm. We don't see ourselves uh, on container ships or LNG ships or it, it, it doesn't suit. Well, we can we can do it and we can generate some savings or power mm -hmm. or thrust from it. Um, it. It is not exactly our market segment. So again, uh, and to start with what I'm keen to do, you know, we, we have lots of great ideas and, um, and we're out there with the analysis world. But when we start, we need to start with, uh, I'll call it our smaller rig, you know, but it's still 36 metres high, which mm. is 41 metres above the deck. These are still big bits of kit to start with. And so we're aiming, you know, ideally at the sort of Panamax, Camp Samax style vessel uh, as an opening. You can put it on much bigger vessels. Um, that's fine. You know, it has a correspondingly less uh, effect the, the size of your vessel goes up. Right, right. So p potentially more rigs, potentially larger rigs would. Yeah, would exactly. So if you're if you're you know Newcastle Max, you'd really want the, the 46, 48 meter style rigs, sure. probably three or four. Um, and you know if you get very big, you're probably looking at the 60 meter rigs. But uh, again, from our side, you know we're 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 happy to start with the 36s and get them out there and, and functioning. You can put them on any size vessel as you like. As I said, there, you know it's just. Uh, you, you won't be potentially getting the savings that you could in uh, in percentage terms with a slightly smaller vessel. Right. No. In, interesting. And you know, one one thing I just wanted to touch on, you and, and you've already kind of uh, alluded to this a little bit. Um, the changes in the shipping industry. I mean, this is an area that fascinates me. I've I've been in the wind propulsion scene for for a few years now. Um, you know. I know that you've come into as as uh, the CEO quite recently into windship technology, but you've been observing this this sector, this segment, and something made you jump as well into this segment. <laughs> How what changes have you actually been seeing in the industry that made this a good time for you to 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 join the game, as it were? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting, and I can't say you know whilst I've been in the maritime area. Uh, for well, all of my life in, in one way or another. Uh, I, I can't say I'm a dyed in the wool shipping, shipping man my, myself, but over the last few years, uh, I think, and, and I, I see this, this is not just the shipping, I see this is, is generically, um, most of us have become more aware of the need to reduce emissions, carbon, greenhouse gases, to be more environmentally friendly, you know, it, and it's gone from a statement um, that, that was you know 10 years ago just there and oh yeah we should do this that and the other to actually being actually this is this is quite real and actually we do need to do something mm. and businesses um businesses are around to make money you know all of us the directors of the business are actually charged typically with with turning a profit for a shareholder um and what we need to do is align that turning a profit for a shareholder with the right environmental conditions. I'm a great believer that's if you align those kind of things, you're in business. And, you know, when Windship was founded, I think it was the oil prices that were driving this. So could we save money by using the wind more? It wasn't an environmental thing. And then I've seen that the, the, the EE or the, the design efficiency index has sort of come in and that started to crank up. And then, you know, was very low sulfur fuels going to be forced on the industry? And there was that battle in, you know, 2017, 18, and oh my God, it's real. And then we saw the industry react. And then the next thing is the um, EEX die was coming in. And now it's, it's in. And so that's what you started. So from my 
last few years of, of being with Winship and observing, you begin to see that this legislation is really beginning to come home. And so mm. with that and the customer change, because it's no good just beating an industry with legislation. There is a customer drive, whether it's the shippers or the customers of the shippers oh, are absolutely. beginning to push through. And, you know, you see it in, in ESG and finance and, and, and that that whole movement is happening. So shipping can can now change because its customers are changing and mm. legislation I'll say helps. I'm sure there's a lot of people saying legislation doesn't help, but legislation does help. It provides a pathway that people need to, to need to follow and then you can plan. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's what that's what I see. I suppose in, in a, as a long answer to your quick question, what's changes? I think the legislation is beginning to push and I think the customer pressures there. I think the whole I'm trying not to use the word environment, the whole the whole environment that we're in yeah. has become more conscious and that's what makes it. And, and it's, it's a it's a happening thing and it's technology and, you know, it's all sorts of uh, exciting things that you can do and, and really see things change. So that's why I'm excited mm. about it all. No, no, indeed. And and I think, you know, it's come it's come up before that. I, I, I really think that this is the most exciting time for especially for engineers and and designers to be actually in the industry because they're being asked for their ideas, the, you know, and some pretty radical approaches, you know, as, as a zero emissions vessel naturally has to be because it's got a, it's, it's creating a new paradigm. And that's incredibly exciting. Um, yeah. But I do agree. I mean, the, I, I think that the, the one pressure that is ratcheting up is this customer pressure, you know, especially the, it's the B2B pressure that mm. hasn't really been there because you had no choice. Pretty much you wanted to move your, your goods. These are the ships that you're going to move them on and you have very little choice about that matter. And I think that one realization was that, uh, you know, because shipping wasn't included in the Paris Agreement, that uh, that was good, that uh, there was a, an avoidance of yeah. additional pressure. But of course, all the customers were included. And they've done the low hanging fruit. Now they're looking at shipping and the logistics chain uh, for that. So, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, OK, now I'm going to move into the sort of quick, quick fire Q&A round. Okay. Um, so the mastermind uh, chair is ready, is it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your starter for 10. I think that's a different one. But anyway, a different one altogether. University challenge. I want to think. <laughs> um, okay, so um, first question, how did you personally get into wind, wind propulsion? Well, that, that, that's uh, my background is, is maritime, done an awful lot of composite design in, for sailing yachts and, and as a sailing background. Uh, and that's how I knew Simon, who's our lead chief technical officer in, in Windship. And so I've been talking to Simon for four or five years. And uh, so my background in composites, et cetera, meant that this was a, a bit of a, not a natural transition, but yeah, a kind of a natural transition. And, and I can see this technology being a bit like the wind turbine industry, which um, showing your age, Kevin, and mine the same way. But in our lifetime, you know, wind turbines have gone from almost a mad idea to a worldwide very sensible industry uh, in, in the space of, of 30 years so and and this can do just the same thing yep no absolutely absolutely and if you could pick the most significant remaining barrier to wind propulsion just one <laughs> what, what, what would, otherwise we're going to be here all day what would that be and why I don't I don't see there's a challenge in terms of the technology. I think where we're at at the moment is is convincing people to change their outlook. And I can include all of us in this. But, you know, this is the change from purchasing something that uses a free fuel. So we have to have a capex at the beginning, but your operation costs are down as opposed to a low upfront purchase cost. But paying whatever the market rates for, for your OPEX in terms of fuel as it goes ahead. So I think that that's a, not insurmountable, but that's one of the challenges that we have to have to fight our way through. No, fair enough. And OK, what what is the, the these these are a couple of uh, questions that I find particularly interesting. What is the most common misconception that people have of your of your uh, system or of wind propulsion in general? And how do you dispel that? 
I suppose that comes up whether whether it's uh, I'm explaining to people outside of shipping or inside of shipping. But uh, I would say um, you say you're putting sails on ships and everyone thinks you've stepped back 100 years and has it got canvas and ropes and how do you, you know, why are we going backwards? Um, and I think to a certain degree in the shipping industry, it's getting over the fact that these items are quite robust. You know, this mm. is not a, a flimsy paper aeroplane wing we're sticking up there, but a very solid, powerful ring that has every right to be there. And uh, again, going back, you know, how do I convince people that this is right? I, I do say take a look at the at the wind industry, which started with, you know, 15 meter blades and is now currently turning out over 100 meter blades in a fairly short space of time in terms of two, three decades. So uh, I think you can you can get a feel for what is possible. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, OK, a couple more. What What is the most frequently asked question that you get? <laughs> Um, what is the most frequently asked question? So far, I mean, I, I do appreciate you've only yes, been in the position for a couple of months. In the four months, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose people are very interested in the technology, but also, um, you know, I suppose the internal battle is 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 going to be how much it costs. That's 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 the most you know, it, it it's great. What does it cost to put on my ship? How much fuel will it save? Those are the sort of quite natural economic questions that we get from customers. Yeah, um, and you and you touched on the you touched on the EU uh, price of carbon at the moment, which is yeah has yep. doubled in 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 the last year. Yes. Um, so I think that that's going to feed into that question as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and that whole how do you trade it, and you know what markets are going to be there? Is it regulated and you know, uh, again, uh, as I heard recently in the discussions, you know, people putting forward whether it should start at a hundred dollars a ton and whatever. But uh, but yeah, yeah, plenty to okay. do there. And and my final question, um, you know, everything's going well. It sounds like uh, you know developments are really ratcheting up. Are you currently recruiting or expanding? <laughs> no, I'd love to be. Um, so we we're at the point where. We're carrying on with our current crew until such time as we get, I think when we get our AIPs in the next few months. Uh, and at the same time, we're on our an investment drive. Um, we hope mm -hmm. then to be recruiting. So I'd love to say send your CV. You can, of course, send your CVs now. Um, but I think realistically, we're a few months before we're pulling people in. So you took the prime position that was on offer. <laughs> that's it. I'm and no, and it's, the door's closed. Now. <laughs> anyway, no, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, well, I hope. Uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, spreading the announcement when you are recruiting. In the Excellent. Um, so, uh, Graham, I really appreciate uh, you know that discussion and 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 the Q Q and A. You stuck to you stuck to those one minute uh, slots very well. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hand you over a one minute slot just to give us a wrap up, a summary or a takeaway for, for the audience. So handing over to you. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, firstly, I've, I've enjoyed this Gavin immensely. So it's, it's been good fun. The, um, from, from a takeaway of Windship's point of view, we are uh, not nearing the end, but we've done an awful lot of concept work. Um, we've refined a design now that we think um, not, not just stands up and holds water, but is a, is a very competent holistic design for both the rigs and the drivetrain system. Um, we're, we're heading through the uh, AIPs, as I said, and, and uh, at the moment we're fingers crossed we'll, we'll be fine on that. And then we're into the, the detailed design phase. And that point, we said we're looking to get some investors on board. Um, we're in good discussions with a variety of different people as to um, potential customers. So we're hoping, as most of our customers are, to try get things locked together. Fantastic. And it sounds like one's on the phone right now. Yes, obviously the, the investor's phone just as we were there. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to then get into our building and prototype phase. Well, thank you very much, Graham, for for joining us today and, and giving us a, an insight into uh, the windship technology, you know, especially the zero emissions concept vessel, which is a, a really interesting project, and into the general development. So uh, saying thank you to Graham Harvey, CEO of Windship Technology. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you to the audience. Uh, that, that's the end of another Listening to the Wind interview. We will be back um, with another pioneer of, 
of the industry. And I'd just like to say, if you have any additional questions, if you'd like to send those to me or to Graham directly, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer those. And to everybody, stay safe, stay well, and fair winds. Thank you.